the last session of the first day, in fact, the last or the penultimate session of thoughts of the entire workshop, which is that how it should be. Um, I'm very excited that the first talk is Edwin Simpson because he works at the building next to me, and I have never heard um, him talk about his research. He oh, works very excited, okay. so having traveled across the world, Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the machine learning work that I've been doing alongside my uh, supervisor, Steve Roberts. And um, so this is all about intelligently aggregating the responses from our volunteers and also looking at how we can use information that we've learned about the volunteers to decide uh, who should do which task to improve the efficiency of our uh, citizen science projects. So first of all, there's a couple of big problems that we so we all know about. Our volunteers um, vary in their skill levels and their interests and thus sort of overall reliability. Um, and typically we handle that by throwing lots of people at each data point we want to analyze. And so we can end up with a lot of redundancy. And this sort of conflicts with the other problem that we have, which is that we've got a large amount of data that we want to process now, and we need some way to prioritize that. So what our at work would like to do is to sort of increase the accuracy of our results, um, but also to use our volunteers' time more efficiently by deploying them to uh, tasks that they're needed to, to uh, perform uh, rather than doing lots of redundant tasks. We can also look at how uh, people who are, seem to have particular expertise should be deployed and whether or not we can have some additional data such as features describing the objects we'd like to analyze that uh, can be used to automate some of the classification process uh, and perhaps take away the easy decisions from our volunteers so they can focus where they're really needed. So, okay, the general kind of problems that my work has been focused on are these basic classification problems. So we have some kind of object, like a galaxy, and we have some set of classes at the bottom. Um, different types of galaxies, and the aim is to learn the target class, which is some variable t. And initially, we've just got a prior uh, distribution over those classes, so we know that perhaps some classes are more common than others. And what we want to do is get a load of responses from our crowd of smiley green faces and <laughs> uh, update the distribution to this uh, posterior distribution here. Okay, so the question then is how we do that. Where is the comparison between the, uh, the uh, probability distribution in the observed data versus reality? Because even our observation might not be correct. Um, okay. So, uh, <coughs> well, so we need to have some kind of uh, ground truth to test this against. And, um, yeah, so I don't quite understand what you were doing. Well, well, I mean, uh, if, if we have a certain fraction of, if, if we don't have galaxies, yes. right, let's say in our galaxy data we find 30 to 70 percent split of certain shapes. Oh, I see. Okay. And how do I relate that to reality if I don't know if my observation was, I mean, maybe in astronomy I have covered everything, but I don't know, but my resolution might change with depth, with redshift or whatever. Okay. Uh, so so but maybe you're not actually treating that because that's further analysis. You're treating more possibly in not. terms of what's the observation. So, so you assume the observation is ground truth, I think, and then to question that would be only a further step. Ah, so we th there can be some unreliability in um, so, for example, these images. We don't necessarily assume that you can find the ground truth by looking at that image. So there can be so this will allow for there to be error in the combined decisions. Um, so you may have, yes, you may have some blurry images that you can't really classify just from that image. And what we're going to see is that we'll come out with a prediction. No matter how many responses we got, we come out with a prediction here that will still be uncertain. So I think that's probably how we handle it. Um, how this um, things like our Prior distribution over the different classes varies um, as you change the way you've collected these images, for example, um, or the different categories. We're not taking that into account here, but you can do that, of course. Um, okay, so the methods that we've been using, quite a lot of text, actually, <laughs> are Bayesian methods. So 
what I mean by this is that we're taking a, a principled approach um, using Bayesian probability theory to combining our evidence from our different volunteers. And what we're trying to do is avoid having to set um, by trial and error some thresholds for determining when we've reached a consensus about the class of an, uh, an object. Uh, what the Bayesian approach allows us to do is quantify our prior beliefs explicitly. So, for example, if we know that if we believe that uh, volunteers are typically better than random, we can we can say exactly how much we believe that. And throughout the whole model, um, we can quantify our uncertainty. So we have um, <coughs> uncertainty in the target class for a particular object and in the reliability of uh, our individuals. And what I should say down there, that's hidden, is in, the prob in these probabilities and reliabilities themselves. So we may be uh, <laughs> unsure as to how reliable the person is. Okay, so, uh, so what we do then is to calculate this posterior using uh, Bayes rule. And, and you can see this is the prior year of the classes. And this term here is what we need to learn. It's a bit darker now. Uh, this is a likelihood function. So the likelihood of these responses, uh, depending on what the true label or the target label should be for this object over here. Um, to simplify the process of determining that likelihood, we use this common assumption, which is to assume that our individuals are conditionally independent, and then we get a nice product here where we can take the likelihood just for one uh, individual uh, volunteer K. <coughs> and so this is the probability of their response depending on what the target class of the object is. If we look at that in more detail, this is kind of the Part of our method, um, it can be drawn. This uh, likelihood can be written as the matrix pi, and this is a sort of table which tells you uh, along this row here is the sort of true class or the target class of the object, and along the columns we have um, the different responses that the person can give. So in this example here, we've got somebody who's getting things correct 70% of the time. So this. Uh, matrix captures the behavior of the volunteers, and sometimes we refer to them as agents because, in fact, these could be any kind of uh, algorithm or person that responds to the object we'd like to classify. So because it doesn't really matter what these responses mean, as long as we get different responses for different target classes, we can include lots of additional data in the same manner. So perhaps features of the object, like if we could run an automatic uh, algorithm to detect um, the different uh, the bars on the galaxies. So now we need to look at how we would learn this pi. Well, it's part of this large model, which um, probably don't need to worry too much about the diagram. Sorry, I was going too fast. Um, so if you have this additional data, Yes. You say additional agent there, but would you could you also do you ex expand that matrix? So if you have target class A and something else tells you that it's it's blue or whatever, would yeah. you take into account different uh, responses? Yeah, so you could have so this K would be K corresponds to a different volunteer or a different feature or a different variable that you can measure. Um, and in our work, this has only been this three values. So we pay the Bs. But you would, so for what you're talking about, there would be a separate table for uh, some feature that's had columns labeled red, blue, and so on. I think that's what you would see. So you've got a collection of these different matrix matrices. OK, OK. Well, say, say, say I, I knew that. Um, for red galaxies, you yes. look like every time, whereas for blue galaxies, they, ah, okay. they, they struggle. Can I, could I fold that information? Um, yes. So that I haven't drawn on here, but you would do that by having some additional rows on here. Um, so you could, yes, you can have this as, uh, this. say these are two classes that you want to learn. Still, you might have these two classes for red and these two classes for blue. And, and you can learn it. And you can learn it. And the 
um, when you've got, if you hang up with a lot of different rows, then you're going to get less data about the individuals. So you need to be a little bit clever about how you then perhaps share information between these rows when the rows are actually related. So at the moment, I'm assuming I'm not assuming any kind of relationship between the rows. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. So in this is this forms part of this model that we've been using called IBCC. Um, and this this computer matrix pi is available here. And what this is showing is sort of the, um, which variables are linked to which other ones. So the responses from the crowd are down here at C, and those depend, the probability of those responses depends on this pi and the target length. But these pi's are uh, unknown variables, so we have a probability distribution over those. And uh, we that thus can put prior information about those uh, into the model via this parameter up here. And the other side, we have a similar situation. So we've got different proportions of our target classes, and that may be uncertain as well. So we represent that with this uncertain variable here, which is a sort of kappa, not really a k. Oops. And uh, <laughs> that, again, has its own uh, prior hyperparameters. So, these hyperparameters are kind of the inputs to our uh, learning algorithm. And you use these, um, for example, you can specify that you have no knowledge at all about what these uh, class proportions might be. And you just set, you would set this, that if you've got a problem with two classes, you just set these to ones. But if you've got some knowledge, for example, you know that there is um, one class which is much more common than the others you can stick uh, a much larger value on that class. So the proportions of those different um, values in, your, in this array um, correspond to the proportions of the classes according to your prior knowledge. And as we see data, uh, some examples of these, as you see these uh, proportions then get updated. Uh, and on the other side, we have a similar situation for those computer matrices. Okay. Yeah. Just to remind me, K runs over the uh, different citizen scientists, and I runs over the different targets? Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't mention that. This, is, this box here, you've got um, yeah, all the different objects you're classifying, okay. and here you've got all the different classifiers. So classifiers could be a citizen scientist? Citizen scientist, yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, so this matrix here looks rather like the uh, the one I showed before, pi, and that's because it's parameters of pi, and it's um, contains your prior pseudo counts, we call them. So this example is equivalent to having seen uh, this particular classifier having made the correct decision twice and then the incorrect decision once for this type of object and the same again for this type of object. So this allows us to say in this case that we think the person will be better than random, they're giving them by the answer around two thirds of the time. Uh, and as we see examples, that, those counts will be updated, and we can learn a much um, more accurate individual distribution for pi. Uh, how how do you get, again, the comparison of being correct and incorrect? OK, so um, <clears throat> what I haven't shown very well is go back all the way to, well, in fact, this, it's so a pi. Each entry in this matrix um, corresponds to um, this for different values of t and c. So if you've observed um, person k making response a, then um, you, so if they make response a, then the probability that they make response a, given that the target class is actually a, is much higher than this. So as long as there's a difference between these two rows, you can uh, learn something. And that goes back into that function here as a product uh, of all the individuals like it. No, maybe I'm missing something, but uh, um, how, how can we apply it to citizen science if we don't know what's the ground rule? Because it seems to be okay. always relying on that we know what the answer is. OK. So, um, <coughs> There's two ways that you can put in knowledge into this. Um, so for example, we might have some examples of uh, 
T for a subset of these, so the gold labeled objects. But we may also just have, um, <coughs> we can have a un completely unlabeled data set, but if we have some confidence about um, our volunteers, then we would set those, uh, we would set these priors here, and this would um, cause us to believe that um, usually the majority would be correct. But because there's a complex set of relationships between these different um, uh, individuals via the objects they classified, um, it can learn um, who looks like the most reliable and right. so on. Yeah. I think just keeping an eye on time, we should hold for the questions <laughs> till the end of the talk, because okay. otherwise, yeah. This is a little bit too to to complex to squeeze in. But, um, so, if I start with this little point at the bottom, and get rid of that thing. Yeah, move there. the mouse that way. Where is the mouse? We'll just hit play with it. Oh, so that's, that's not my problem. Okay, now let's come back. <laughs> <laughs> The X, the X. Well, that clap. <laughs> oh, it's gone oh, no. with. I don't know what happened. Right. Full <laughs> screen. Full screen. Yeah. Okay, that's it. And then we've gone too. Far. Oh, that's no, not too far. Anyway, um, so the point that we were just talking about was that um, what we do is run a semi-supervised learning algorithm. So when you have very limited training data, so labeled examples. Um, you can also infer um, these unknown variables from the latent structure, so the relationships between uh, people's responses, people uh, <coughs> who respond similarly, and so on. Um, and the algorithm that we use um, to, to learn this is relatively simple, and it's uh, it's variational Bayes approach, which um, <coughs> sort of iterates between. You start with an initial guess for your variables, and then you iterate between updating these ones and then these ones, and eventually it's guaranteed to converge to um, a good approximation. Uh, so we find this is actually a very fast algorithm, and although it sounds extremely complicated, the functions you actually have to implement are not too bad. Uh, so in the runtime, it's down here on an example data set from CPMOB projects, we found that using a <coughs> traditional sort of Bayesian approach is rather slow, and so are using traditional weighted majority and weighted sum uh, learning algorithms. But the BB approach, which we've been using, is nice and fast. That's all to say there, really. <laughs> OK, and also, importantly, it gives us far more accurate results than um, <coughs> the other methods that we've tried. So this is our result from IBCCDB. Uh, on, on a sample of uh, galaxy memory data. And just taking the mean of the responses gives us only uh, sort of two thirds correct of the response. Actually trying to learn weights, uh, in this case, for individuals using some of these other established methods made things worse. I think that's mostly because we didn't have enough information about some people who'd only made a few responses. And this graph on side is the uh, RFC curve. That's a so false positive rate against true positive rate. So we can vary a decision threshold about what, so when our method outputs a probability of an object being a supernova, we can decide whether to filter that in or out. And as we vary that threshold, we get different uh, numbers of true and false positive objects. And the best place to be is up in the top right corner, so nothing, no false positives, and all the true positives found. So our curve for the IBCC methods uh, is pretty well, but these other methods are sitting way down here, so <coughs> you're going to miss a lot of the interesting examples if you use the alternatives. Okay, so <laughs> what we can also get out of our model is um, some very interesting information about the individuals. Okay, uh, so we ran a community analysis method to sort of cluster those pi matrices of uh, our volunteers, and we found these five different distinct categories, which are behavioral types. Um, not to talk too long about this, but we find that there are some people who behave as you would respond, so they give um, minus one scores to objects that are not, that are really not uh, supernovas, and then they give ones and threes and ones that are, and you find a huge group in the middle of people who only ever 
give my time to everything. And some other people at this end there who are giving what appear to be either very pessimistic responses, never giving a score of three to things that really are super nervous, and others that give that don't give the minus one score, uh, who are sort of optimists. But um, we can handle that with IBCC because we've got this model of the, uh, the behavior of, uh, sort of by this computer matrix. Uh, I think there's an opportunity here to exploit this a lot more to help um, improve the questions that we set that give to people and perhaps target some training or some make some changes to the system that would help improve the performance of these people. Uh, another piece of work we've done is to look at how people's behavior changes over time. <coughs> so uh, through either learning or getting bored and so on, uh, we've got these confusion matrices can be made to change over time. Uh, and this diagram we've got somebody from that is using a note who starts off uh, with uh, making responses that are rather similar. <coughs> uh, that regardless of what class of object they've been presented with. <clears throat> so these two lines, um, the location represents the probability score that they will give to the object we see. And over time, their score for objects that are not supernovas tends towards the one in this case. So we've got somebody who makes quite a large change after making their initial classifications. Um, so I think this is an important thing to take into account. Um, <coughs> Okay, the next part was this intelligent tasking um, problem. So we want to naturally trade off learning about the agent's behavior by giving them uh, tasks for which we know the answer to some degree. So either those simulated tasks or ones that have already been labeled <laughs> by the crowd. We want to balance that between, with uh, actually learning about these objects of interest. And what we can do is to look for a pair of uh, volunteer and object that maximizes the information gain over our set of target labels. So we've done some tests with that on a text classification problem. And this is um, uh, was, was a good thing to test this out on because we were able to use the textual features extracted from words and the documents to um, <coughs> learn how to classify similar objects uh, <coughs> So when we have only a small handful of labels from the crowd, we can classify the entire set. And in this graph here, what, uh, what this shows is that from the, these lines down here are making random selections of documents to give to people to classify. And after a while, they tend to stagnate. So the accuracy is along this y-axis, and it's not improving very quickly as you ask for more labels if you select tasks at random. However, if you do so using this information game method, uh, you see some quite quick learning. And <coughs> yeah. Okay, so the future things that I think we need to do are to look more in detail at uh, different kinds of interaction beyond just these uh, classification problems. And in particular, learning how people uh, make decisions. Perhaps they can label the features they've looked at in the objects so that we can start to automate more rapidly these uh, classifications. <clears throat> I think we can adapt the tasks as well by looking at how informative different questions within the decision tree have been. And I think it's probably not. So the other point that we haven't really thought about very much is uh, how people are treated uh, as people, not just uh, <laughs> some sort of function call. Uh, so it would be nice if we're uh, computer scientists to just sort of call out to a citizen science uh, function there and just get the response back, but we need to really consider what people want to do. So there's perhaps limits to intelli this intelligent tasking idea that we haven't yet considered. And then the final point was just, uh, I think we can do a lot more to exploit this uh, idea of the these different behavioral types. Very good. That was so much easier than the hours I've spent doing the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so I see various people in the room not not in the Um So I understand how this can work for wavelength tasks if you're trying to yeah. put them in the class. But let's say you're trying to find a cluster and then you just based upon user markings. How do you go from a 
a discrete set of labels to a continuous set of labels for a location on the image. Um, well, we need to adapt. We certainly need to adapt it. But I think um, it goes back to looking at that uh, likelihood function we had earlier. So we had this. This, uh, oh, it's gone. this one is just a very simple. This matrix is quite a uh, simple likelihood function. Well, I think we can try different things that will. Uh, so would that end up being like a Fourier transform between a label as whether that's part of a feature or not? And does that come into play by the map? Or can you make this? I think we can sw switch this to continuous distributions that will solve that problem. As Stephen and Phil, comment on that, what is my question? So I guess you could you model it as a Gaussian distribution. Yeah. And you just have your parameters of your Gaussian. So we, that's the right. discrete number of parameters that describe continuous. Yes. So we would, yeah, we would learn how, um, so if I understand correctly, we'd be learning how, uh, we, the thing we'd be interested in would be the, the variance, how accurate somebody was uh, for the different classes of objects. Um, and there's a slight problem with continuous data I think we haven't tackled is that this independence assumption perhaps doesn't work as well. Oh. One of your many. <laughs> <laughs> it was just about to, I'm really pleased that we're going to get to spend four days. And <laughs> <laughs> um, can we have a look at the, the plot where you showed the, the Asian? Seeming to change over time. Oh yes, that was slightly rational. So I always wondered, in, and I haven't read the paper for reasons I'll explain over a bit. Um, <laughs> is this really the the volunteer changing with time, or is it our understanding of the volunteer changing with time? Oh no, in this case, um, this is all run retrospectively. So the data points at the beginning of time are here. Uh, we have we have inferred. The confusion matrix given the whole data set. So it's, but it still may not be the volunteer because there may have been changes in the types of objects that they were seeing. And no, so no, 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 no. are we seeing your model for the for the volunteer changing? Is it really that flexible that you have parameters describing the the change with time right. of the volunteers? Um, so I I believe that this is the um, Change in behavior that comes from the data, not the model learning over time. <clears throat> uh, the there is some flexibility in how fast it should be able to change. Um, so some of the are we working? Some of the changes early on may be consistent with getting a better understanding of the confusion matrix, but later on, they are more likely to be changes of behavior. I don't think so. I, so I think it should be, it, well, if you had a very strong uh, prior distribution, I think that could be the case. But that wasn't what I 